We're going to cover several aspects of renal replacement therapy. And I will touch on the two issues, why and, and when. And really to set the scene, I'd like to start with a very short case. I'm, I realize there is a separate case discussion later on. But this, this case is only really to get us thinking about the topic. These are my disclosures, and they have not affected what I'm going to say. So I assume you're all clinicians working in the critical care unit, and I'd like you to imagine that you're on call when a 66-year-old man gets admitted with sepsis. The working diagnosis is a possible community-acquired pneumonia. And on admission, as you can see here, his creatinine is 98, which is, uh, translates into 1.1 uh, milligrams per deciliter. His potassium is safe. He has a usual past medical history of smoking, some angina, which is controlled, and smoking-related obstructive lung disease. These are his gases on 10 liters of oxygen via face mask. So as you can see, his pH is a bit on the lower side, uh, and he is hypoxic. This is his x-ray. It's a real case. Uh, and this is the reason why the clinicians think he may have a community-acquired pneumonia, because his, uh, there's a density on the left. So he gets started on non-invasive ventilation. He tires very quickly, has to be intubated and ventilated, and following the intubation, he's commenced on noradrenaline. All this happens uh, in the acute admission unit, and he gets subsequently transferred to the intensive care unit. And my question to you at this point is, would anybody start renal replacement therapy? So if you think you would start, can you raise your hand now? Who would, and if you don't want to start, can you just raise your hand? So in, at this point, the majority wouldn't want to start renal replacement therapy. So the next day, he's fully ventilated, or he's on 65% of oxygen, he's on, still on noradrenaline. His urine output is tailing off, his creatinine has clearly re, uh, jumped from 98 to 161. His potassium is safe. His x-ray looks worse. And clearly, on 65% of oxygen, his gases are worse. Here is his x-ray. And it's worse. So who would start renal replacement therapy now? Anybody? Not yet. OK. Presumably, you either want more information or you wouldn't start. So the next th day. Still on 60% of oxygen or a little bit more of noradrenaline. Urine output tailing off. He's accumulating much more fluid. He's now three and a half liters positive compared to admission. His creatinine has risen further. His urea is up. Potassium is still safe, and his gases show he's becoming more acidotic. But his pH is still 7.26. And I put it to you again. Who would start at this case, at this point? And the point here really is, that some of you would start and others wouldn't. And there is no right or wrong answer. But the people who would start clearly have reasons, and the people who think they can wait or will also have their reasons. And just to highlight things a bit more, the next day, assuming he doesn't get started, the next day he's still on 65% of oxygen, he's on more anotropic support, urine output has tailed off further, he's accumulated more fluid, his creatinine has risen further, and as people often do, they may then think he's a bit more overloaded because his x-ray is worse, so he gets a diuretic challenge, and he passes a little bit more urine. And of those who didn't want to start earlier on, who would start at this point? Okay. So the, again, as I said, there is no right or wrong answer. The point is that we all at this point have different thresholds to start. Because we, in real, because we don't have clear guidelines, mandatory guidelines when to start. And we may base our decision on our clinical assessment, 
and our uh, projection, we, uh, the trajectory of the patient. And in the next 15 minutes, I really want to explore this a little bit more. So before thinking about starting renal replacement therapy, we have to just keep in mind what we're actually trying to achieve with renal replacement therapy. So renal replacement therapy has become an essential therapy for the care of critically ill patients because it's a fantastic artificial type of organ support to remove uremic toxins, to remove excess fluid, to correct uh, metabolic disturbances, uh, to remove uh, drug metabolites, and to achieve a bit of metabolic homeostasis. In critical care, in the critical care environment, unlike the dialysis setting, where we're dealing with end-stage renal failure, in the critical care setting, we also think about renal replacement therapy when we want to prevent dysfunction in other organs. So we want to prevent severe respiratory failure as a result of fluid overload, for instance. So progressive fluid overload with progressive respiratory failure may be an indication to think about fluid removal with renal replacement therapy. Ultimately, it's a type of organ support which is hopefully temporary, which will hopefully only be necessary and allow the kidneys to recover. So it's kidney support during a time when the kidneys cannot cope with the demand put up on them, put on them. And these demands are metabolic demands or fluid demands. But before we talk about the when and the timing, I'd also like you to briefly remember that this term renal replacement therapy is not completely correct because these machines which we use are not replacing renal function fully. They are fantastic machines to remove water and solutes and excess electrolytes. But they do not do any of the other functions of the kidneys. The kidneys are fantastic organs with multiple functions. Tubular functions, so they reabsorb amino acids and important uh, electrolytes, important nutrients. They are endocrine organs. They generate and produce hormones like vitamin D, EPO. They are the, the, um, the site of various hormones. They help us regulating our blood pressure. They're also metabolic organs. They have a role in generating, producing glucose. And the machines which we use at the moment, although they are fantastic and help us, they do not replace any of these functions. So they only provide partial replacement of kidney function, i.e. they can remove water, they can remove excess electrolytes, and they can remove excess waste products. But they have become essential in the care of critically ill patients because they do exactly that, what I've just said. They can uh, re-establish fluid homeostasis and they can reestablish metabolic homeostasis. And they can also help us preventing problems, like preventing severe fluid overload or severe uremia. But all of this comes at a price, because it's a therapy which, like other therapies, has side effects and potential complications. And these complications start with complications arranged from the complications related to a line insertion, so bleeding, infections, pneumothoraces, to potential complications during the therapy, for instance, the unrecognized losses of drugs, unrecognized losses of nutrients, potential complications due to the anticoagulation, or uh, the adverse events for or adverse effects for the staff, in particular the nursing staff. And then there's also a question whether uh, renal replacement therapy, when started too early, can prevent the recovery of renal function. <laughs> 
So when you think about starting renal replacement therapy, these are the factors which have to be kept in mind. Yes, it's a therapy with fantastic benefits, sometimes essential to help patients and help them to survive, but a therapy with potentially serious complications. And in some of the reported renal replacement therapy studies, like the uh, re renal study, a dosing study, 50% of patients had an adverse event during therapy, so one in two. So that brings us to the next question. We have thought about starting. We are aware of the, the benefits. When is the right time to do so? If you go to the literature, you'll find numerous studies looking at the exploring the role of early versus late renal replacement therapy. And in fact, at this time, we, still, we already have eight randomized controlled trials, and we have more than 20 observational studies exploring the question, is early better than late renal replacement therapy? Or the other way around, is late renal replacement therapy as good as starting very early? The problem with these all these studies is that they've used different criteria to define early or late renal replacement therapy. And different studies have used either criteria like a particular creatinine value or a particular urea value or a stage of acute kidney injury. Some studies have even looked at, have defined early by the time between admission to starting renal replacement therapy or time since admission to hospital. And just for your information, I'll just show you these six randomized control trials very briefly. These are the first three, and I want you to focus on the criteria in the column on the right. And as you see, three studies which use different criteria to define early versus late. In blue are the positive studies, which showed that early was better. In white, the studies which made no difference. Three more studies here. These are historical studies, randomized control trials. Again, look, looking at different patient populations using different criteria. And it's not surprising that they came up with different results. The most, two most recent studies were uh, published last year and it's important to be aware of them. This is the Akiki study, which is a large multi-center randomized controlled trial conducted in France. And they randomized 620 patients in 31 ICUs. And in this study, early was defined by having acute kidney injury stage three plus being on the ventilator or in need of vasopressor th support. And if patients were randomized to the early arm, they were commenced within six hours of meeting these criteria. Patients randomized to the late arm were remained off renal replacement therapy until they developed more complications of acute kidney injury as listed here. So late renal replacement therapy was defined by really needing acute renal replacement therapy quite urgently due to the development of complications of acute kidney injury. And as you may know from the publication, this is the graph which gets pr produced and shown regularly. There was no difference in 60-day mortality between these two groups, absolutely none. So 48% versus 97%. When they went further, they also looked at the proportion of patients who actually had renal replacement therapy. And clearly patients who were randomized to early renal replacement therapy got renal replacement therapy. And patients in the late arm only got renal replacement therapy if they developed any of these complications, which I showed you. And if you do that, then it turns out that 50% in the late arm never needed renal replacement therapy because they never developed a complication of uremia. 
And so you could be tempted to say that you can wait because if you wait, then first of all, the patient does not come to harm, and secondly, you may prevent the need for renal replacement therapy in 50% of patients. And that's exactly what the study showed. There's only one caveat, and this is that the patients who needed renal replacement therapy late had a much higher uh, mortality. Although the overall mortality in the late group was 49%, there was a huge difference between those who, got st who had renal replacement therapy um, at a late stage versus those who never needed renal replacement therapy. So if you were randomized to the late group and didn't need renal replacement therapy, mortality was 37%, much better than the early group. But those who needed it late, when they had developed complications, had a very high mortality of 60%. And, and this is, I think, a key find, a very important finding. The problem is, if you're at the bedside at the moment, you do not know whether the patient has complications tomorrow or the day after. If you knew that, if, you, if, some, if you're dealing with somebody who's got acute kidney injury stage three, and you knew that they didn't have complications tomorrow or the day after, you could wait safely because it's safe and the mortality is quite low. But if they get complications, then as you can see, the mortality is high. And at present, our problem is that we don't have a test to tell us who will develop complications tomorrow or the day after and who won't. The other st important study was the Elaine study published at the same time. This was a single center study performed in uh, a different patient population. These were mainly cardiac surgical patients. And in this study, the criteria for early and late were different. So uh, early acute kidney, uh, early renal replacement therapy was defined by meeting the criteria for AKI stage two. Now, in this study, patients were only randomized if they not only met acute kidney injury stage two, but also had a positive biomarker test and had some other indications of some organ dysfunction, either respiratory dysfunction, fluid overload, or needing hemodynamic support. Patients randomized to the early group got re replacement therapy if they met these criteria, i.e. acute kidney injury stage two, which is, means a doubling of creatinine plus a positive biomarker in this particular study. Patients randomized to the late group had to wait until they developed renal replacement, uh, acute kidney injury stage three, that's when they got renal replacement therapy. And in this study, as you may know, there was a huge difference. There was a significant difference in mortality at 90 days. Patients randomized to early renal replacement therapy had a, better mortali had a lower mortality, better risk chance of surviving. Now, the key aspect is obviously it was a different patient population. They were mainly after cardiac surgery uh, and some of them were, had to start renal replacement therapy because of fluid overload. So in this group of patients, it may be that earlier is better. But that's what we're dealing with. So we've now got eight randomized controlled trials, of which the two most recent, the best most recent and the most important studies showed conflicting results. So it is no, no surprise surprise that clinicians at the bedside, like you and me, when dealing with a real case, have come to different conclusions, as we've just seen when we discussed this first case. Some of us are early starters, regularly early starters, and some of us are quite happy to wait until patients have a real indication. And again, there's no right or wrong answer because we don't really know at this point. One of the APCI meetings, an APCI meeting held last year, dealt with the question, when is the right time to start renal replacement therapy? And the focus here was, this was an APCI meeting dealing with uh, personalized medicine. 
And we went back again, a step back, and said, what does renal replacement actually try to do? Well, it tries to replace kidney function when the kidneys can't cope. And we have to recognize that all of us have a, some, a degree of renal reserve, and all of us have kidney fun kidneys which work to different degrees. Uh, hopefully, all of us in the room have normal kidney function, but patients will have a degree, may have a degree of impaired kidney function. So we start off with different degrees. At the same time, during critical illness, we have to cope, and in our kidneys have to cope with a particular demand, which is either a metabolic demand, or in some patients it's a fluid demand, fluid overload, or in some it's both. And we put it to you that if the kidneys have enough capacity to cope with the demand, then and, and demand and endogenous capacity are in uh, are similar without any difference, then at this point, there is probably no need to start renal replacement therapy because the kidneys are coping with the load. But if you've either got impaired kidney function or the demand is so high, either fluid overload significant or the metabolic demand too high for the body to cope with, and there is a gap between our capacity and the demand, then that's the time to think about renal replacement therapy. And this scenario is different for each individual patient. So we put it to you that we should not look at an individual or separate or particular creatinine value, but look at the individual patient and their situation. So I propose a an algorithm to you which at this point may work until we have more information from current and ongoing studies. I put it to you if somebody has acute kidney injury and life-threatening complications which can't be dealt with quickly, then you th need to think about renal replacement therapy and start it if it's appropriate. If there's not an immediate indication, then it's important to optimize the patient as best as you can and then go back to the patient, reassess the situation, reassess the response to your resuscitation, the response in terms of kidney function, but also other organ, or organ functions, and regularly re-evaluate re the situation. And if you come to a situation where the kidneys cannot cope with the burden, and the patient either becomes progressively fluid overloaded, or progressively acidotic, or other organs suffer, in particular the lungs, then that's the time to think about renal replacement therapy, independent of a particular creatinine value, independent of a particular fluid balance. So it's the irregular reassessment of the individual patient situation. So in conclusion, renal replacement therapy is a fantastic therapy which helps kidneys during a time when they're struggling to meet the demand, but the kidney, the, the artificial machine does not fully replace kidney function, or the other functions of the kidneys are not being replaced. And it should be considered when there is a gap between what kidneys can endogenously do and the situation they have to deal with. And this decision needs to be individualized and is different for different patients and different scenarios. Thank you very much.